So we're going to begin talking about parasites. And the first thing we have to do is talk about the different classes, the classification. And for human parasites, the two important groups are the protozoa and the worms, the hemolyths. And then we're going to also, of course, discuss very briefly how insects play a role in um, the transmission of some parasites. And so we're going to have classification. Classification of parasites is very complicated, um, but within human pathogens, the protozoa parasites and the metazoa, or our worms, our hemolyth parasites, are very important. So with respect to our protozoa parasites, we're going to have different groups of parasites, and each of these have specific important human pathogens. So our balantinium is going to be leading to a persistent diarrhea, and this is in our ciliated group of protozoa. We then have our flagellates, which our flagella um, protozoa are going to be leishmania. Leishmania is going to be caused by an insect or transmitted by a sandfly. And the thing about leishmania is that if it is a subcutaneous type infection, um, it is going to be lethal. Um, if it's a superficial infection, it, it is going to be cleared. We also have our trypanosomas or trypanosoma cruzi, for example. These are going to be transmitted by another vector, the tsetse fly. These are going to be flagellated, but they are going to have a very specific motion. They move around like a corkscrew. And trypanosoma is going to be called sleeping sickness, African sleeping sickness. Um, Jardia is going to be associated with cyst um, in water sources. We have our, our sexually transmitted disease, tri Trichomonas vaginalis. And then we have our amoebas. Our true amoebas are the ones that are going to be our um, brain-eating amoebas, such as our nuclearia. Um, we also have acanth amoeba. Acanthamoeba is going to be associated with contact lenses, fresh water. Um, so as long as you use a clean water source when you clean your contact lenses rather than a tap water source, um, acanthamoeba is not going to be a problem. Um, our entamoeba is going to be the, the uh, cause of am amoeboid asosis, um, and that's basically dysentery is um, caused by a parasite where you have bloody stools. And then nagleria is the one that is going to be in fresh water. Those are the ones that are commonly in the news where a child is swimming in fresh water and gets infected with this amoeba and is unfortunately going to succumb to that infection within days of exposure. And then within our protozoa also we have our sporozoa. Um, some of those Famous ones are Plasmodium, the cause of malaria. We also have Cryptosporidium, which is going to cause um, a small intestinal disease. Toxoplasma gondii, which is going to cause toxoplasmosis. This one is going to be um, associated with undercooked meats and pork products. Um, and then with respect to our worm infections, we have our flatworms and we have our roundworms. And roundworms are given the name because they're tubular shaped and flatworms are given the name because they're flat. And so our flatworms are our trematodes and cestodes, so our blood fluke, such as schistosoma. Schistosoma next to plasmodium is, um, according to the World Health Organization, one of the most um, detrimental worldwide diseases. Um, and so schistosoma is going to uh, be colonizing blood capillaries and they're going to colonize those capillaries that are close to either the bladder or the mesenteric system. And so depending on which one they colonize, the um, parasites will be released either in the urine or in the stools of the infected persons. And then we have our tapeworms. Um, those are typically what people think about when they think of worm infections. We have our beef tapeworm, uh, Cygnata. We have our pork tapeworm, Solium. And these tapeworms um, are going to be uh, GI infections. And then finally, we have our roundworms or our nematodes. Um, so our hookworms are very famous for this, our Necatara americanus, um, ankylostoma are two types of hookworms. 
and we have Ascaris, Ascaris lumbricoides, Strongyloides are also going to be these tubular roundworms, and we'll talk about a few of these. So again, classification is going to be very complex. Within the protozoa, we have those seven phyla, um, and then within each of those phyla, they're going to have uh, different organisms that cause disease. So we have our trophozoite, which is shown here. And then our trophozoites can, uh, these are going to be infectious, and they can form cysts. Cysts are going to be similar, similar to a spore. And so when you form a cyst, you're basically forming um, something that's going to be protective. And so those protections um, are going to make it so that you can survive harsh conditions. Whereas the trophozoite is going to be the active feeding stage of um, these protozoa. Malaria, for example, um, and Giardia, for example, are going to have trophozoites. Now you're going to have um, some amoeba are going to have pseudophilia. Some are going to be phagocytic. Some are going to have AP complexa, which these are going to be sporozoa or coccidia, and they have spore forming um, capabilities and organelles that help uh, the organisms penetrate host cells. We also have ciliated cells, and these are going to have rose cilia. We have our only human parasite, the bal and tidum, and this is going to be, um, again, the only parasite within that group, and it's going to cause uh, gastrointestinal diseases, chronic diarrhea type of syndromes. Now for nutritional requirements, basically our amoebas are going to use pinocytosis, so they're going to kind of drink their environment. Some are going to be able to eat larger areas through phagocytosis. We are going to have our uh, flagella and ciliates taken food um, into a very defined structure. So they're going to sort of have these compartments within them that are going to um, take in food and then store food. Food is going to be stored in vacuoles or granules. These protozoa are going to be facultative anaerobes, so they can live in aerobic and anaerobic environments. And their elimination of waste is simply just to excrete it from their cell surface. Now again, these protozoa can form cysts. Um, parasites that cannot form cysts is important. They have to have typically an arthropod vector as an intermediate. Um, so their life cycles tend to be complicated in that they have a human cycle as well as an arthropod cycle. Malaria is such a uh, parasite that has this. Um, many of them can actually change their surface antigens, and so they can make themselves hide, camouflage, look like our cells. They can pick up our proteins and stick them on their surface, so our, our immune system thinks that they are part of your body. The reproduction is going to be by binary fission. Um, you're going to have um, sporozoans by multiple fission, um, and sexual reproduction is going to be sporogony or gam. Ganymede cognate. Now our hemolus or our worms have different categories. We have our nematodes, trematodes, and our cestodes. Um, and so we're going to have our trematodes are our flatworms, our cestodes are our tapeworms, and our nematodes are our roundworms. Uh, these guys are going to be complicated and they can be very large or very small. So we have a dwarf tapeworm, for example, and then you have your beef tapeworm, which is much larger. Now the worms are going to have a protective cuticle layer, and this is going to help protect them from the environments. For a flatworm, this is called a tegument, specifically. And then some of these guys are going to have hooks. So a hookworm has a hook. It's able to bite, bite you and invade you. They can have suckers, which allow them to adhere to your epithelial cells lining your intestine. And they can have teeth, which allows them to invade and cause dysentery. Their nervous system and excretory systems are going to be primitive. Some are going to have an alimentary tract, but no true circulatory system. And then we're going to have these two phylas. 
So for our worms, they're going to have active ingestion of our tissues, so they eat our tissues, or they can have passive absorption, so they can actually take in nutrients that are in your small intestine. So um, one of the side effects of having worm infestations is malnutrition because the worms are eating or taking up whatever is being brought into the body. Um, they are going to be able to metabolize carbohydrates. They are able to form glycogen, so they have um, fuel storage capabilities. Um, their respiration is going to be anaerobic, but some of the larva forms require oxygen. For example, your hookworm is going to be able to um, live in the environment and it has to actually have a cycle or growth in the environment before it can actually be transmitted to humans. So for our worms or reproduction, they are going to lay eggs. Um, and most of them, again, are oviparous, lay eggs. Some are going to have larva, uh, so viviparous. They are going to have, again, those protective cuticles or tegumens, depending on which category they are. Um, and then they're going to be able to alter their antigens on their surface. And again, schistosoma, which is a very important worldwide pathogen, um, is going to be able to look, make itself look like our cells by incorporating host proteins. It simply just grabs things that are in the environment and sticks it on its surface. And schistosoma can be a very long, um, chronic type of infection. And then just very quickly, we'll talk about arthropods. So these are going to be um, the largest group within um, these in our kingdom of Mammalia. They are multicellular organisms. Um, they're going to be a vector for many of our parasites. Malaria is very well known to be transmitted by the bite of mosquito. We have Leishmania that's going to be transmitted by the bite of a sand fly. We have our sleeping sickness, the tsetse fly, so they're all going to be vectors or hosts for our parasites. And so the arthropods are going to have segmented bodies. Um, they have legs, paired jointed appendages. Uh, they're going to have very well de developed our digestive and nervous systems, and they are not hermaphrodites, so their sexes are going to be separate. Um, again, they're going to have, depending on if they're in water or if they're in the environment, their respiration is going to be obviously different in the aquatic environment. They do have gills similar to what a fish would have. Um, and then they all are going to have chitin, which is going to be a hard covering over their surface. So they, it's referred to as their exoskeleton.